Welcome back. I'm astronomer and author Jeffrey Bennett, here now with part two of the video I've created for the Totality app to help you understand the science of eclipses. As we discussed in part one, a lunar eclipse can occur only at full moon when the moon is on the opposite side of Earth from the sun, and a solar eclipse can happen only at new moon when the moon falls into line with the sun as viewed from Earth. But why don't we have eclipses every month at new and full moon? In this video, we'll explore when and why eclipses occur. Let's begin by looking down on the moon's orbit around Earth, with dark cones representing the full shadows that each world casts into space. Starting the animation, we see that, as you already know, the moon's shadow can touch Earth only when it is here, at the new moon position. Resuming the animation, we see that Earth's shadow can fall on the moon, creating a lunar eclipse, only at full moon. Let's now back away until we are looking down from high above our solar system, so that we can see the moon orbiting Earth while Earth orbits the sun. From this viewpoint, it might look as though we should have eclipses with every new and full moon, but we don't, and the reason is that the moon's orbit around Earth is slightly tilted to the Earth's orbit around the sun. To see the idea, let's focus on the moon's orbit in one place. This animation tilts our view so that we can see the tilt of the moon's orbit. The tilt is only about 5 degrees, but it means that the moon spends most of its orbit either slightly above or below Earth's orbital plane, crossing through this plane in two places that we call the nodes of the moon's orbit. Notice that this particular orientation cannot produce eclipses because the moon's shadow falls below Earth at new moon, and the moon is above Earth's shadow at full moon. A good way to visualize the three-dimensional nature of these orbits is to imagine Earth's orbit on the surface of a pond so that the moon's orbit crosses through the surface. Here, we show the moon's orbit in four different positions over the course of a year. Now, the nodes are the points at which the moon splashes into or out of the water on each orbit. And if you connect them with a line, you'll see that this line keeps approximately the same orientation throughout the year. Notice that there are only two time periods each year during which the nodes line up close enough with Earth and the Sun to make eclipses possible. These periods, called eclipse seasons, each last a little less than five weeks, which is enough time for both a lunar eclipse at full moon and a solar eclipse at new moon. In other words, we have eclipses when two conditions are met. First, it must be either new or full moon, new moon for a solar eclipse and full moon for a lunar eclipse. Second, the new or full moon must occur when the moon is very close to a node, which means it must occur during an eclipse season. If this were the end of the story, the timing of eclipses would be very easy to predict. We'd have eclipse seasons exactly twice a year, with a solar eclipse at new moon and a lunar eclipse at full moon. But there is a further complication to eclipse timing. Although the diagram makes it look like eclipse seasons should come exactly six months apart, they actually come slightly more often about 173 days apart. This is because the nodes don't stay perfectly fixed in the moon's orbit. Instead, they move around much as shown here, but far more slowly. The combination of the 173-day period between eclipse seasons and the moon's 29.5-day cycle of phases makes eclipses recur in a pattern that repeats about every 18 years, 11 and 1 3rd days, a time period called the Saris cycle. You can see the idea on this map, which shows the paths of totality for total solar eclipses from 2017 to 2040, with paths of the same color representing eclipses separated by the Saris period. Notice that these paths, such as the ones for 2017 and 2035, also move about one-third of the way around the world, a direct result of the one-third day in the Saris cycle. This fact helps explain why ancient cultures had difficulty predicting the precise locations of eclipses, even when they could predict the timing. In addition, ancient astronomers could not always predict the precise type of lunar or solar eclipse, such as whether a solar eclipse would be total or annular, because they weren't aware of orbital details such as the precise way in which the moon's orbital distance varies over its orbit, as shown here. Today, with these details known, we can make precise eclipse predictions thousands of years into both the past and future. Finally, it's worth remembering that we see spectacular total solar eclipses only because the moon is just the right size and distance from Earth. 
If the moon were farther away, it would never be able to cover the sun completely. If it were much closer, it would block the sun's atmosphere as well as its surface, so we wouldn't see the beautiful corona. Astronomically speaking, the moon's just right size and distance is an amazing coincidence because the moon has been gradually moving farther from Earth since the time it first formed. Long ago, when the moon was much closer, it did cover the sun's atmosphere during total eclipses. And by about 600 million years from now, the moon will have moved far enough away that total solar eclipses will no longer occur. That completes our introduction to eclipses. If you'd like to learn more about eclipses, or astronomy in general, you can consult my textbook series, which is the source of the animations and much of the artwork in this video. I hope you have found this video useful and welcome your comments. If you'd like to support the creation of these free videos, please look for my books from Big Kids Science and consider making a tax-deductible donation to the nonprofit Storytime from Space program, which sends books and science demonstrations to the International Space Station, where astronauts video themselves reading and demoing with the videos posted freely for anyone to use.